we learned. I'm going to do this with us every week. We're going to remember the statement we dealt with last week, and then we're going to begin to deal with the statement we want to deal with this week. So by the time this is all over with, we're going to rehearse eight statements every week. I'm not asking you to memorize these. I just want you to know that we processed it, and we have dealt with what does this mean in my life? What should I do as a result of this in my life? Okay, so read this with me. God is faithful, therefore I have faith. Let's say that again. God is faithful, therefore I have faith. I have faith in my life because God has shown me what faith is by being faithful to me. Now let me revisit something else we talked about last, night, last week. You remember we talked about God is faithful and I can have faith in Him. And part of understanding that was remembering something. Let's see if you still agree. God created everything. Amen? God created everything, and that means he created you. Amen? God governs everything. He is, char he is in charge of everything. He is over everything. But the second part of that we learned was that God loves us unconditionally. You remember this from last week. The fact that God is huge and in charge is only part of the scenario. In fact, if we have a creator God who is all-powerful and he doesn't care about us, that does us no good. If we have a creator God who is all-powerful and he's angry at us, that, at us, that makes our lives even worse than they were before. But we have a creator God who is all-powerful and he loves us unconditionally. That's part of why we have faith in him. Well, let me tell you something about him, something else about him. Not only is he the creator... Not only is he all-powerful, let me tell you this. He is also all-knowing. He is all-knowing. He knows everything. And by the way, since he knows everything, every choice and every decision he makes is the right one. Because he knows it all. He knows what's going to happen next. He knows what's around the corner. He's already been to the future. He knows all these things. And back up, he loves us. And back up, he's all-powerful. So if an all-powerful God and an all-knowing God who loves us asks us to do something, tell me why we would not do it. Think about that just a minute. If we actually believe our theology then the only logical thing for us to do is to follow what God has to say because God, here's your statement, you ready? Here's this week's statement we're going to wrestle with. Because God is right, always right, therefore I obey him. God is right, therefore I obey. That's what we have to, that's what we're going to wrestle with today. God is, oh, hey, let me, let me, let me check this. Let, let, let me check. How many of you can amen the statement, God is always right? Amen. All right, you know what I know? I know that many of you who just said that do not, in fact, most of you, well, likely all of you that just said that don't always follow through on what you just said you believe. Because if you know that God is right, why would we ever not obey him? If we know that God is all-powerful and always right, and we know that God loves us and wants the best for us, why would we ever fail to obey him? And yet we do. Yet we struggle with that. We wrestle with that. In fact, can I tell you something? Many of you are not excited about the fact that we're preaching this sermon today. Because obey is not a word you want to deal with. Obey is not a concept you want to deal with. You don't want to, you're, you're like, obey. I don't obey nobody. I didn't obey nobody since I was in back my mama's house. I'm not going to obey nobody. I mean, I'm in charge of my own life. I'll make my own decision. I did it my way. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Look, the issue is we don't like the word obey. It feels demeaning to us. It feels lessening to us. It feels overbearing to us. It feels immature to us. The word obey makes us feel all those emotions. The culture we live in, the way we've been trained, the way we've been brought up, the way we've been, we've been pressured by the society around us tells us that obedience is not a good thing. But friends, I've got to tell you, when we are dealing with the creator God of heaven, 
who loves us and knows everything about us and everything about everything around us and knows what the future holds and wants the best for us in the future, obey is precisely what we need to do. Let me illustrate the struggle that we have with obey, and let me do it with, with, a, with a story from the Old Testament. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 5. And as we get into 2 Kings chapter 5, Elisha is the prophet over Israel. You have to understand that the, the, the relationship, the way that Israel is governed during this period of time is that you have a king that is in charge of the government, and you have a prophet that speaks to the spiritual life of the country. And so you've got the king and the prophet, and the prophet at this point is Elisha. Now, in our story in 2 Kings chapter 5, we run into a very important and powerful man named Naaman. Now, I want us to read this story, and I want us to, I want us to see how God dealt with Naaman and how Naaman had to deal with God in order to see his life change. So let's read this together. It's going to be a fairly long set of reading, but stay with me. Let's go through this. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. You understand this, right? An, empower, an important, powerful man who has a sickness he can't do anything about. All right, so let's keep reading. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him 10, 000, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Now, some of y'all will know, well, just how much is that in modern terms? You ready? Lean forward. A whole bunch. Let's keep going. <clears throat> the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Listen, have you noticed the guy that should have realized that God is the answer to this question forgot it? The king of all people should have known, okay, here comes this thing that God's got to do. That's not my role. My role is the king. My role is the government. I need to send this guy over to Elisha. That didn't dawn on the king. The king thought that the king of Aram was just trying to come over and pick a fight with him. It never dawned on him, oh, send him to Elisha so he can be healed. Elisha hears about it and says, what are, you, what are you whining about? What are you all upset about? Calm down, I got this. Just send him to me. And the king of Israel must have gone, oh, well, yeah, duh, okay, got it. Let's keep going. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. He waved his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. We're going to stop reading there. Look. We have an instance here where a very important man, 
a very powerful man, goes to the man of God, the prophet, and says, I have a problem that they tell me you can go to your God and find an answer for me. And he is then given instructions. The question is not whether he is given the right answer. He is given the right answer. The question involved in the middle of the story is whether or not Naaman will obey what he has been told. And the problem is Naaman really doesn't want to. Now, I believe what Naaman struggles with is very much the same things that we struggle with as Americans, as people who are usually in charge of our own decisions, as people who are usually in charge of our own things, as people who usually make our own choices in life and celebrate our freedoms to do so. We struggle with a lot of the same ideas that I think Naaman is struggling with here. Therefore, I want to say to you today that we must obey God. God is right, always. Therefore, we obey even if, and I'm going to go through three of these. We obey even if what God has called us to is humbling. Even if it's humbling to us. Even if we have to humble ourselves in order to get it done. Listen to the story. Think about what Naaman did. Naaman, Naaman went, he had the letter from his king. He's a great ruler. He's a great, he's a great leader. He has a letter from his king. He brings it to the king of Israel. He has all of this money. He has all of this stuff. Man, he can pay for it. He's, he's strong enough to demand it. He has all the authority. He walks up. The king of Israel cowers in his presence, really. That's what's going on. The king of Israel is afraid now that the king of Aram will come and destroy him. This is just a ploy. So he's, he's freaked out the king. Can you imagine Naaman's, uh, Naaman's attitude at this point? Mm-hmm. I am big and bad. You better bring me what I asked for. And so they send him to Elisha. And he struts his way up to the front gate of Elisha's house. We know what he had in mind. Because it says what he had in mind. He expected Elisha to walk out the door of that house and greet him. Oh, Naaman, great and mighty. We are so glad you have come. It is such a privilege to bring God to this man, Naaman. I'm so glad you're here. And they go, oh, show me the spot. They show him the spot. He goes, it was all good. That didn't happen. That's what was in Naaman's mind. I just really described to you, rather in a rather flowery fashion, what Naaman said. That's what he expected. That's not what happened. He gets to the door. He struts his way up to the door. And a servant comes out and says, hey, you're Naaman? Yes, I am. Hey, boss man says you got to go dip in the Jordan seven times. Have a good one. <laughs> Can you imagine? Naaman's going, what? Seven. Jordan. Got to go. That's all he gets. Y'all listen. Sometimes, did I tell you God knows everything? You know what that means? God knows us. And sometimes God will give you an answer that you don't like just because you got to deal with what you don't like about the answer. He knew Naaman. And he knew Naaman was high-minded. He knew Naaman was full of himself. Now, God could have told Elisha, go out the door, wave your hand over the spot, and boom, it'll happen exactly the way Naaman expected. But God did not do that. God knew that what Naaman needed was not only a healing from his physical ailment, Naaman needed a healing from his being too full of himself. And sometimes God will give us an answer that causes us to deal with the one thing we don't want to deal with. And we must humble ourselves because our healing and our blessing is on the other side of our humbling. So y'all got to hear this. 
Obeying at all is a matter of humbling myself. Anybody I choose to obey, I choose to in many ways bow down to. If I'm going to put you in charge of my world, I am at least figuratively going to bow down to you. I'm going to say to you, your opinion is more important than mine. I'm going to say to you, your ideas are more right than mine. I'm going to say to you, you are now in charge. I will choose to obey you. And that's what Naaman had to do. Naaman thought he was going to come by his healing because of his importance. And God said, no, you're not going to buy your healing because of your importance. You're going to get your healing because you learn how to bow down to me. Now, folks, I got to tell you, In our lives, that's what, mm, can I tell you, as Americans, that's what we struggle with. We don't like that. We don't like that at all. We want God, look, God, God, you do, I tell you what, it's kind of, look, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I'll tithe real good, and you just bless me, all right? I'll give you a bit, in fact, you know what, Lord, I love you. You you did a good job this week. I'm going to throw a little extra in the plate. Like you're tipping God somehow for keeping your sweet tea glass full. That's not, that's not the deal. That's not how this works. This is not a matter of you somehow giving enough to God that he owes you something. This is not a matter of you being so important that God owes you something. This is a matter of you bowing down to the ruler and creator of the universe, understanding who he is, thereby understanding who you are, and then thanking him for the fact that he chose to show enough grace and love to you to heal you. Because, and all you got to do along the way is obey him. But that requires that we humble ourselves before the God of heaven. I must be willing to follow him. God is right, therefore I obey even if it is humbling. Let's go to the next one. God is right, therefore I obey even if it is different. Even if it is different from what I expect or what I think is normal or acceptable. See, God didn't ask Naaman to do something that he thought thought was proper look at these words here the servants came to him i love that the servants in the story are always the ones with the right answers the servants came to him and said my father if the prophet had told you to do some great thing would you not have done it absolutely if the prophet had walked out and said you must go slay the dragon on the third mountain he would have gone out to slay the dragon If the prophet had said, go conquer this army over here and come back and you will be healed, he would have gone out and conquered that army. If the the servant had said, go out and, and find all of these riches and bring us back riches at this level, he would have gone out and he would have slaughtered some nation and brought back the riches and gotten his healing. But they didn't ask him to do any of that. They said, go to the river, the dirty river, and dip seven times. Well, that's not, well, what? What? Wait, what, what, the river? That river? I don't like that river. That river is nasty. You really want me to go there? Come on, Lord, can I go to the Caribbean? Now, I mean, look, the, the, we expect things of God that are kind of like what Naaman described that he expected. You know what most of you want? Most of you want to come down here, down front, and have Pastor Aaron and I get around you and pour oil over your head and pray over you and the, and, the, and the choirs of heaven begin to break loose and sing. And then Pastor Aaron smack you in the forehead till you fall out on the ground. <laughs> That's what you want. And, and don't, don't get me wrong. Sometimes God works in that kind of miraculous, powerful way. Sometimes God does that. But let me be real frank with you. 
Most of the time, he does not. Don't you hear me? Listen. God changes our lives through the mundane repetition of right things. I need you to hear that. I need you to understand that. God changes our lives through the mundane repetition of right things. God gives us in his word. He lays out in his word what we are to do and how we are to live. When we follow this word on a day-to-day-to-day-to-day basis, and we learn to obey this word on a day-to-day-to-day-to-day basis, God begins to change our lives. Listen to me. Listen to me. He changes our lives when we obey him Day after day after day after day after day after day after boring day after boring day after boring day after long day after long day after long day after hard day after hard day after hard day after tempting day after tempting day after tempting day. You see what I'm saying? That's where God changes our lives. You say, well, I don't want that. I want to go to a tent meeting revival and I just want to blah. That's what I want. Well, listen. The vast majority of the time, God works through the mundane repetition of right things. Once in a long while, I've been doing this a long time, and once in a long while, I'll see God do something just just blatantly miraculous. But most of the time, I see God start to change people's lives Because they finally humble themselves enough to say, you know what? I don't know what's best for me, but God does. And then they start living in it. If God had asked you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Well, God didn't ask you to do some great thing. He asked you to do right things over and over and over and over and over again. And that is going to produce great things in you. You know what I'm saying? It's all obedience. It's obeying God until obeying God becomes so habitual, I don't know what else to do. That's what's going on. Okay, okay. God is right. Therefore, I obey, even if it's humbling, even if it's different. And this brings us to the next point. Even if it's slow. even if it's slow. Why in the world did Naaman have to dip himself in the Jordan seven times? Seven times. Some of y'all are going to give me some highfalutin answer. Well, seven is the perfect number, and it is the number of God, and therefore... Hello, Naaman didn't know that. Seven times. Catch the image. Naaman has an entourage. There's not like one or two dudes traveling with him. There's an entourage traveling with this guy. And so they, finally they convince him, you, need, you know, the, the prophet didn't ask you to do something great. He just said, dip in the Jordan, so let's go do it. So, okay, here they go. They get to the Jordan. Naaman says, fine, I'll do it. Stupidest thing I ever heard of in my life. So on the bank of the Jordan, his entire entourage is standing looking at him. And he goes down in the water and he's looking back at him. Naaman feels like a fool. He's in this dirty water in what he considers to be this this country that is beneath him. And he's out in this water and he dips one time. Now can I ask you a question? Do you suppose he wasn't wet enough the first time? I think he was completely wet the first time. And he comes up out of the water and nothing has changed. It's so stupid. I can't believe I'm in this water. They're all watching me. Okay. Second time. Back up, no change. Third time. Back up, no change. He's thinking to himself, when I get out of here, I am finding that prophet. 
And he's going to need his God when I find him. Can't can you just see this going on in his mind? I'll bet you that guy's not for real. I'll bet you he's just selling snake oil over there. That's what he's doing. And I am not, I can't believe if this does not work, I am hunting him down. Four times. Nothing changed. His, his entourage is now going, oh, he looks like a fool. <laughs> it's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly. Oh, I pity that Elisha. He might even take out the king. I don't know. Five times, nothing changes. Six times, he's really ticked off now. What if Naaman had gotten out of the river after six times? Might I ask you a question? Because many of you are on the third or fourth or fifth or sixth time going down into what you believe God has called you to. And nothing has changed. And you're just sitting there, you're getting angrier. You're questioning it. You're thinking, that Pastor Mike, he don't know what he's talking about. And I can't believe that he's got me acting like this. I have missed six parties. <laughs> and I still want to go. What if your healing is after the next one? What if what God... Now look, don't anybody get mad. Don't, don't, whoa, whoa, time, time out because some of y'all are going, okay, I just got to miss seven and I'll be okay. <laughs> That's not what I said. I am making a point from a story in the Bible, all right? I'm saying you've got to stay in there because sometimes what we count as slow is God's timing to actually teach us what we need to understand. And we count it as slow when God knows it's precisely what we need. And you can't give up. I've been doing this for four years. I've been doing this for six years. I've been doing it. Hang in there. Don't quit. Don't ever give up because God's never going to give up on you. And since he's not giving up on you, but he's working in you and he knows what's right already and he's only called us to obey, your answer is right around the corner. Naaman goes down the seventh time and he walks out a changed man. I'm here to tell you God wants to make you a changed, new, powerful person. And it'll seem slow to you. And it'll seem different from what you expected. And it'll seem humbling to you. But if we will simply obey him, he will change us. You say, well, why, Pastor Mike? Why is he so slow? You know that song we've been singing, Refine Me? That refining process is really what this is all about. God needs to remove from your life the things that don't belong there. And that takes time. God needs to remove from your heart the things that are keeping you away from him. And that takes time. God needs to change not just what you do in the moment, but what your habits and procedures are in the natural. And that takes time. And he's working in you. And he's changing you. He is refining you. And he's using difficult situations. He's using tough things to burn away all of the dirt and all of the impurities away from who you are. So that what he can leave behind is the pure gold of the person he made you to be. And that's going to require that you humble yourself to his process. That you deal with it even though it didn't come the way you wanted it to. And that you wait it out so that God can change you in the time frame he chooses, not the one you choose. It's all about obeying. Y'all, I got to tell you, 
I would much rather come up here and, and throw a Pentecostal s- a sermon this morning. I would much rather get up here today and, and, just, and just toss you a sermon that says, if you'll come down and you just pray right and you just say right and you just act right and you just give right, God will make it right. But can I tell you something? It's a process. I, I, I'm not going to try to give you smoke and mirrors and somehow all the flashy uh, fireworks of whatever. I'm going to try to tell you what actually will change your life. And the good news is, God will change your life. For some of you, the bad news is, it's going to take some time. And you've got to humble yourself to what he's called to as long as he's called you to it. Father, I pray this morning that you would make us a people who understand the idea and the importance of obedience. We know that you are right. We will confess that you are the all-powerful creator God of heaven. We will confess that you are the all-knowing, all-sufficient God of heaven. And we will praise you for the fact that you are the all-loving Savior of our souls. Knowing those things, Lord, we now ask that you make us a people who will know you are right and that will drive us to be a people who will obey you at every turn. Lord, encourage us because it is true that, that our lives are changed through the mundane repetition of right things. But Lord, we get discouraged. We're human. We're impatient. We get discouraged in the mundane repetition of right things. But Lord, encourage us. Do not let us become weary in doing good. Remind us that if we do not become weary in doing good, that there is a reward waiting for us. Remind us that you want to refine us. You want to cleanse us. You want to purify us. Remind us, Lord, that you want to make us different and new. And Lord, in the midst of everything that is going on in our lives, make us a people who will obey you and your word. Obey your word as we read it. When we see your word, let us follow what it says. Let us do what it says. And then when your Holy Spirit speaks to us, let us, Lord, listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. Let us, Lord, be changed by who you are. Let us, Lord, be changed by what you do in us. Let us, Lord, be changed by a habitual pattern of obeying you at every turn. Refine us. Make us a clear reflection of you. And in the end, let us give you glory. Because nothing that happens in our lives is of our own doing. Everything that good, good that comes into our lives comes from you. Make us a reflection of your glory. And we'll give you praise. In your name we pray.